So now that we know how elliptic curves work, let's think about it for a moment how we normally use such groups. So when we use them with, with normal cryptography, what you've seen in your first cryptography lecture, is that uh, we want to use groups in the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So this goes back to Diffie and Hellman from 1976, where they showed how to um, use some final group, well, they used the multiplicative group of a fine field at P, and nowadays we typically use uh, the set of points on elliptic curve over some fine field FP as this group, and you need to have some element of G with a known prime order. So it's G is seen as a generator of a subgroup, and that has this prime order Q. And with that, you can do what's called the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Now, what I was involved by doing at the want to exchange keys or compute a shared secret is maybe a better way to call it, is that Alice starts by picking a random integer um, between 0 and the group size minus 1. So that's where this prime Q comes in. And when she has this random A, she computes G to the A. So I'm writing the group multiplicatively here. And so that's, well, taking G A times next to each other and multiplying all of them. Similarly, Bob picks a random integer that's called thing b in the same interval. He computes g to the b, and then Alice and Bob exchange those two keys. So Alice sends it to Bob, Bob sends it to Alice. And then both of them can use their private exponents, these lowercase letters, to compute, well, on, on Alice's end, she takes g to the b, which she got from Bob, computes that to the power a, and on this side, Bob has g to the a from Alice, and he knows his secret b, so he computes g to the a b. But these are integers, a times b is the same as, as b times a. And so when both parties then take this number, well, for further usage in symmetric cryptography, that he will compute the hash to get a key to use then. And the reason that this works is that the exponentiation with a and the exponentiation with b commute. So it doesn't matter whether you first compute to the a and then to the b, or first to the b and then to the a. So that is kind of the we've been seeing this since many many years you learned in school that g to the a b is the same as g to the b a and it can compute as g to the a to the b or g to the b to the a now how does bob actually do his computations so i said well he takes g copies uh, b copies of g and multiplies them together so here would be one way he could be computing this so he defines the intermediate variable t he sets t to be g, and then b times, that was his secret number, he multiplies this thing by g. All right, the first time it's 1 times g, and then it's whatever the intermediate thing, times g. So in the end, he's getting this capital B, which is g copy, uh, b copies of g multiplied together. And yes, that is correct. This is g to the b. This is how you apply the group operation. But our attacker Eve, what would she be doing? Is this a good idea to have a system where this is how Bob computes keys? Well, obviously the answer is no, so let's look what Eve would be doing. Well, Eve could just try and check every exponent. She checks, well, is g equals to b? Is g squared equals to b? Is g cubed equals to b? Until she gets to g to the b. Now, this is always an attack that works. There's nothing special here, but our Eve has just taken as many steps as Bob was taking. So the cost of constructively using it, so what Alice and Bob would be doing, is the same as what Eve would be doing. Well, the constructive cost has to be tolerable, we want our users to do this, but it has to be faster than what the attacker can do, else it's a totally insecure system. So Bob has to do some smarter way. So this takes as many operations as the group has elements, and well, that is not good enough to outpace the attack. So let's visualize this with an example. So here we have a group of just 23 elements, starting with the identity element g to the 0 up there, and then going g to the 1, g to the 2, and so on around the circle, till it gets back to g to the 22, and well, the order being 23, so g to the 23 is the same as 0. So these are all the group elements. And what we've been seeing on the page before is multiply for each step. So we're going from g, from 1 to g, to g squared, and so on, until we get, let's say, Bob picked 13. So we get into g to the 13 here. 
But when we computing this, we can also go from, well, g1 to g squared. But then we have g squares, we can repeatedly multiply by g squares. And so we can do a square and multiply here. So we can do g, g uh, from g to the 0 to g to the 1, and then to g to the 3, 5, 7. So each time skipping 1. Oh, we now have roughly half the number of, of steps we need. And we can go further with the same idea. So for instance, we can do powers of 4, 13 as well, 12 plus 1. So we see 3 powers of 4, and then a single one at the beginning. Or we can also split this as 1 times an 8th power, 1 times a 4th power, and 1 times g. And as you can see from the, from the title already, and you probably also recognize this method, this is the square and multiply method. Or here, as we see, it's the square and multiply and square and multiply and square and multiply, well, until you reach g to the 80, uh, g to the 13. Now, that one is a lot faster. He now needs just three steps. Okay, he also has to get to g to the 4, and he has to get to g to the 8 with another squaring, but these are still fewer steps than he would need otherwise. Now, for my next part, I actually want you to think of this as a graph thing, so let me show you first. Um, so this was the initial method with just multiplication by g, so this is the single steps in the graph. Then here we have the graph which is taking multiplications by g squared every step. Now it's an odd number, so it, it nicely lines up that it runs around twice. And then also 23 is uh, minus 1 mod 4, so also the 4 1 lines up really nice here, and it's minus 1 mod, mod 8, so also this one looks really pretty. So this is like uh, going from g to the 0 to g to the 8 to g to the 16, and then, well, g to the 24, we have g to the 1, etc. And we can now overlay all of these graphs. So then we're getting this kind of, well, it looks like a dream catcher thing. So this nice overlay of all the graphs. So we have the blue ones, which are single step, we have the green ones, which are two steps, the orange one, steps with g to the 4, and then the red one with, with g to the 8. So here we have a graph where, well, if you want to get to g to the 13, starting from g to the 0, we can do one of length 1, one of length 4, and one of length 8. We can even select in which order we want to do those. So we could also go from g to the 0 to g to the 8 to g to the 9, and then a step of length 4. And this graph has a property which is called fast mixing. And that means that if you have a path of log the number of the nodes, you can reach any of the dots. Now the square multiply, you know this because log the bit length is exactly how, how many steps you need, or how many squares you need, and then you need roughly half as many of the multiplications. And if you have windows or whatever, you can go faster. But with log the number of nodes, you can get anywhere in this graph. In general, it's called fast mixing when you have this property. And so, yeah, we like such graphs. It's very nice that we can do Diffie-Hellman on such a graph. And it gives us the desired exponential separation. So the constructive side, what Bob is now doing, applying, well, B, so computing G to the B, now takes log the number of the group elements, whereas Eve has to take something, okay, Eve can also do something faster than the number of group elements itself, not just run brute force through it, but there are uh, methods which take the square root of the number of uh, group elements. So that is the baby step giant step attack that you should know, or Pollard's row method. So both of those achieve that they need, um, well, theta means it is also exactly that expensive, so they're not faster. When you're looking at what Diffie and Helen with Coase and Ritual, so the finite field case, there we actually have sub exponential attacks, but still much, much slower than what our world would be doing. And so if we look at, well, this log, the size of g, uh, how does this compare to the square root of g, then well, square root of g can be written as 2 to the 0 0.5 log g. And so that means for the attack we have an exponential runtime because the group size, the log of g, that is, well, the length of the group, so log of g, not, not g itself, that is in the exponent. So attacks are exponentially harder and the constructive applications. Well, only under quantum computers can. So as you've seen in the previous lectures, so that's the short versus RSA exercise sheet one, and also the Simon's algorithm lecture, they can see that Shaw's algorithm actually 
on a sufficiently large quantum computer, so that's a big caveat, but once there is a sufficiently big quantum computer, it can compute b from g to the b in polynomial time. That's not good. So what can we do? Well, we were studying isogeny-based cryptography in this unit, so of course isogeny graphs to the rescue. So on a high level, what we're going to see is isogeny is going to be a source of very, very large graphs. I mean, the graphs yet so far, you could just, you could see that I got to 13. There's no, no secret there. You want to have something which is too big to actually print out, way too big, but you still should be able to kind of efficiently navigate it. And so with accessionies, we get these big graphs and we can efficiently walk. So we can make moves from one node to the other, similar to like multiplying by g to the 4, g to the 8. Um, we have an efficient way from moving from one node to another. And these are so well connected that we have short path to essentially all nodes. And we don't want to have anything, well, that breaks it. And the nice thing is, if there was just this, this graph view, uh, we don't know anything with quantum computers or classical computers that recovers the path from the, from the endpoint. And if we should get the star here, because you can always do some meet in the middle attacks. And of course, as soon as you get a more detailed description, things can go wrong. But in general, there is no, there's no generic attack that does some big damage here. We also need to be able to kind of find our way because, I mean, if Alice goes this way and then Bob goes this way and then somehow they exchange the sizes and then Alice is trying to do something similar over here to what she's done before and Bob does something similar here, they need to have a structure so they can figure out the direction, like when Alice gets transported to Bob's place, how do you walk the shared part? And if you have like a nice map and you remember you, like, it's a map of Manhattan, so something which is like very regular. And then you remember if you went forward twice and then left three times, then yes, you can put anywhere and you're doing the same move. But if this is a old historical city, for instance, if you go to Utrecht where you have a canal in the middle and you go left and right a few times, depending on how your street curves, you're getting totally confused of where you are. And that would not be nice for this example. So, <laughs> When you're thinking about like how you could get such graphs, um, I mentioned maps already is a nice source. We have very large graphs and well, we sort of can get everywhere. We don't have this fast mixing except for when you think about, well, okay, for somewhat larger distance, you can take a bike, you can take a, a train or you can take a plane. So we sort of have also these different things there. But well, if, if you see tra somebody traveling as, as well, if Eve is watching Alice travel, she knows everything, so there's no security there. And so um, most of the time, even if you come up with more interesting mathematics, you're missing some of those properties. And the nice thing about our southernies, and that's what we're going to see in the next units, is how we actually getting a southernies to be source of all of these nice properties at once.